So I'm very happy that I have this opportunity to address all of you and the audience, uh, given that the audience is, is, uh, is diverse, is, is particularly interesting. I mean, this uh, nexus of arts and engineering, you know, it's very well captured in a lot of the topics uh, as, as, a, uh, as tempting as it may be to go very deep into the philosophies of, of natural language and, and natural language processing. I try to keep today's talk as pragmatic as possible so that you could hopefully have some takeaways in addition to just some food for thought. So, and, and th therefore is this, uh, well, rather provocative uh, title, uh, Our Culture Actionable Insights with Natural Language Processing. So uh, as Gunther has mentioned, I'm Vincent and I'm from VXT Research. Very happy to be here today. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that this insights is indeed a, a controversial word, maybe overused in the big data analytics communities and uh, what it may mean uh, is, is very subjective. But without going too much into that, I'd like to make a reference to how insights and actionable insights in particular relate to uh, your concrete end goal, which Gunther has mentioned uh, on a couple of occasions is to compile a glossary. And in addition to that, uh, complementary to that, a manifesto. And thinking a bit deeper about this, what this means is that, um, you know, the glossary is detailing the what questions, what exists, how do those concepts that exist relate to one another? In other words, those insights, however, it's the action that creates the impact and the manifesto, um, in other words, addresses the so what question. Now you have the glossary, now you have the insights, but so what and why and how? And there's a lot of it that is uh, reminiscent in natural language processing in that the insights might be considered something like explicit knowledge and the action side of things is, it could be strategic, it could be a lot more nuanced, uh, even political or economic. Uh, and the manifesto of Bao Kultur uh, surely is also within a multi-dimensional sphere rather than something which is uh, data. Yeah, And so uh, this is a very nice segue into the discussions of natural language processing where the explicit and the tacit is often combined. So natural language processing is, is interesting for the reason that natural language can describe romance and poetry yeah, and love and all the nuanced things which uh, maybe architects or artists might, might, might talk about. But if you look at an engineering drawing and you look at the label text, you know, label area, it, in, in label block, uh, it, it's extremely specific and it, it is explicit. It describes something that maybe would even be considered machine readable, you know, to make references and use very, very strong terminologies. And all of this is captured within natural language processing, which makes it particularly interesting, but also challenging. So I'd like to start out with just giving you just the concepts, you know, that are related. And you would have heard a lot of these buzzwords, I'm sure, over the years and, and um, especially in recent years. You know, you hear of AI, machine learning, natural language processing, computer vision, and, you know, hundreds of others. Uh, but I'd like to kind of rationalize it a little bit just to illustrate that nowadays artificial intelligence is a very broad topic and it could be described um, in many different ways whether machine learning is involved or not. And machine learning is simply just the instruments, uh, statistically driven instruments usually, that relate to inducing. So it's more, it's not a discrete mathematical technique, but a inductive mathematical technique, uh, which is often used in artificial intelligence because of its nature and its properties. Whereas deep learning, on the other hand, is more a subset of machine learning. So it's a way to configure the algorithm. It's a way to configure the calculations in a certain, um, in, if you think of what they call CNNs, uh, convolutional neural networks, it's a configuration of how, um, basically a series of equations are talking to one another um, and through an iterative process is able to come up with an answer. Now, natural language processing could form a subset of all of these. And it's not necessary that deep learning uh, is synonymous with natural language processing. Although a lot of the uh, most recent algorithms and the most advanced, uh, you would have seen in the media, things like GPT-3 or BERT, um, algorithms that writes its own stories, you know, given a prompt. So those would be often uh, based on deep learning or even uh, adversarial type of neural networks. Uh, whereas a, a, a thing as simple as a search, you know, in a, in a Word document, that could also be considered natural language processing on different levels of abstraction. So that's where I would like to focus on today. The 
uh, machine learning works so that, um, or it differs to traditional computing in this way that uh, in traditional computing, it's a bit like a mathematical equation. Huh? There are some inputs and there are some outputs, so X and Y, and typically you know what the process is that it goes through. So you have some input data, you put it through a factory and out comes a product. However, in the machine learning side, it's particularly useful to look at problems where the, the rules or the process is not really known. So as an example, you know, in the machine learning field, uh, how do you identify the picture, you know, on the, on the level of pixels? What is a cat and what is a dog? So a, a human would be able to do that, but the, the rules that one has to articulate becomes actually very, very complicated. And therefore it's useful to see this almost as in uh, systems analytics, uh, they talk about reverse problems where you have inputs and outputs uh, a similar analogy could be drawn to understand this amongst uh, structural mechanics is that it, these are boundary conditions. You don't know what happens in between, uh, but you give the input and the output as what we call training data, machine learning, and being able to generate this abstract model, which is kind of the, the, the gold nuggets. And often this abstract model could also be used then in the traditional computing paradigm to generate outputs that would seem to be very intelligent or that would have required human intelligence to do. Uh, natural language processing is interesting for unstructured texts um, for a couple of reasons. So one challenge is that within a natural language text, there's a lot of topics that are chaotic and distributed. And what that means is that there's a lot of noise in there. There's a lot of non-important non words within a, with, within a data set or with, within a, a natural language text data set and how to tell the signal from the noise, how to distill what is important, what's not. This process is very similar to if you're a researcher and you're giving keywords to a particular article. Um, that process, you know, how does that cognitively look like is, is very tricky to articulate. Uh, there's also this issue of heterogeneous data. You have numerical and categorical data mixed in with semantic content. So you may have an existing dictionary or an existing lexicon of metadata or, or words that you want to tag or you have certain dates or names of people or names of locations all of which has a certain discrete semantic implication when you do information retrieval or insights type of problems and of course this issue of mixed languages how to separate these for the human it's second nature but for the machine it has been very difficult um, so Effectively, I don't want to go into an, on an algorithmic level uh, talking about vectors and you know how they correlate with one another. But effectively, uh, the output of an algorithm is something that looks like this, where uh, it appears to learn in uh, quotation marks the meanings of the text. So this is another side of the story where where texts are related to one another in different ways. So they are not all equally discrete, separate symbols, uh, but they have. Uh, semantic relationships that are quite different. In this example, it's very easy to see that drone and drone will have a 100% match. You know, consider that to be a type of score. Mathematically, it's more like a correlation um, that is applied after some noise reduction. So uh, uh, let's say the relationship between drone and copter, helicopter, a drone between aerial, uh, aerial photography and drone. To a human, it's intuitive that you know, drones are used in aerial photography. Drones are used in inspection. There is a semantic relationship. But computationally, in, in the traditional sense, if it were to be keyword-based, character-based, this type of match would be very difficult to infer. And therefore, um, retrieval systems that would be based on this will have a lot of what we call false negatives, where uh, relative data that needs to be retrieved given a query or a search is missed out. Um, this does not only happen on a word-to-word -word basis, uh, an output like this, you know, automated robotics factory and machines capable of intelligent manufacturing. Um, with machine learning algorithms, you could get high, let's say, correlation scores. Uh, and the thing to note is that there are no, there are no words that are shared between these two, uh, two phrases. But a human will know the associations. You know, robotics has to do with automation, has to do with... Uh, used in manufacturing and automation may be intelligent and so on and so on. So it's quite a multidimensional context. But okay, now you have a primer, you know, about 
what NLP does, why it may be important in theory, but what does NLP have to do with AEC, so uh, Architecture, Engineering, and Construction Insights, and therefore Baukultur. So I, I hope to provide you with a uh, maybe a more relatable context of constructability. So, and I'm sure there are audience members who are structural engineers or, or, uh, or architects. And, you know, you design the drawing, you give it to the contractor who's on site, who has to do the execution here on the right-hand side. And upon looking at it, the contractor says, no, no, this is not going to work. I need, to, I need you to make these and these changes. Goes back, engineer changes, goes back to contractor. Contractor starts to implement the, the design, you know, starts to dig and build. And there comes a host of issues. Uh, a lot of which cannot be mathematically modeled because it has to do with rework delays, uh, conveniences, a lot of common sense related things that are based on the contractor's own uh, experiences. You know, one contractor might find a problem uh, with a certain design, but not another. One site might have a certain uh, problem with a certain types of design, but not another. And uh, therefore it's a very multidimensional problem. Uh, so constructability issues are considered to be, I think in my mind, quite similar to Baukultur. It has to do with a certain culture, maybe in some cases belief systems, you know, about uh, what, what are the types of construction techniques to use versus the type of structural configuration. So in these examples, um, we take 98 text passages that describes constructability issues. You can think of these as as little snippets of a complaints box. Yeah? So here's an example to illustrate. So one guy says, on the majority of projects, the information flow to the contractor is late, okay, resulting in delays to the project. So he talks about delays from the design side. Another talks about fast track project ring beams designed as concrete. The engineer should have specified box steel beams for speed. So obviously uh, this particular contractor would like, uh, well, it, it is a, you can consider it a principle as well that uh, you know, steel constru construction is much, much faster because it's modular than something which would be cast in situ. The last one, rebar size is too big or spacing too little for concrete to be vibrated in beams and columns. And if you know about concrete, you know that that is cast in situ case that would never have happened if it were to be a precast configuration. So there's a lot of things that when one tells stories about uh, constructability, it's very difficult often to generalize so how does one get, you know, how does one get the uh, the quantitative side of of such stories? So we train the algorithm using these these texts, and the idea is to see if we can find links between concepts that would be related within the constructability logic. So it's important to note that this is not ground truth. You know, this is limited and biased by the 98 text passages that goes in, which may or may not apply outside of that 98. So uh, here we see an output that shows a similar kind of example that I'd shown with a drone, you know, roof, okay, obviously uh, with roof 100% match. But then we see that probably timber roofs has a much higher correlation and it is able to see, well, you know, it's able to see that the waterproofing is uh, a particularly a common problem uh, for roofs. Uh, steel roofs, for instance, would have a little bit of a correlation and you can interpret that however you want. It might not even be significant. Whereas you could also get negative correlation where it is almost seen as the opposite in terms of the vectors. And that might not mean something intuitively, but at least if one were to sort these, uh, one would be able to get a, a quick overview of the types of issues. A query like concrete might also give this type of, you know, quite common sense type of understanding about you know, crack and shrinkage and vibrations. And, and, uh, and that is related, of course, to most cases in situ. So it suggests that the data set that is provided is very much biased towards in, in situ concrete. And therefore the problems that, that arise would be due to them. And uh, basement or similar type of, um, of, of uh, analysis. Uh, and you see that water, groundwater and, and dampness and flooding and soil is, is very prevalent within this particular data set. So there are, you know, 101 ways to visualize this. This is one of many. If you put, for instance, all interesting text to one side of the matrix and then also to the other side and create a correlation matrix or a similarity matrix where 
of course, down the diagonal, it would be one because then you will have the same thing matched with the same thing. Um, after putting it to the matrix, you could do clustering so that they are arranged hierarchically, uh, like in this way, this is called a dendrogram. Uh, this gives structure to what otherwise would be rather unstructured data. And very quickly, you can see the different clusters that form. And you can, in this particular example, quite easily inspect what those clusters are. So if you draw a line down a particular level, you see where the clusters split up. And we can go through a couple of them just to illustrate. Uh, I've put here precast twice, just so you understand that the dendrogram works so that if it's an identical concept, they are joined by a flat line at the bottom. And uh, then the next one would be you know, launch, uh, which would be one cluster related to um, precast. In this case, it makes sense because launching uh, as a construction technique is often uh, related to precast members. You, you won't launch a, um, a, a cast in situ member because it's just cast in situ. Uh, and then we see some issues with form work and supplier and the trusts. So one can go about and try to interpret uh, these types of clusters to get what we would consider to be insights about constructability. What, how is constructability um, defined and, and what are the concepts that are that are within constructability that one has to look out for. But again, bear in mind this is based on just the 98 text documents. Um, I also hope to illustrate with this that certainly big data is not always better or is not always necessary. I think there is a misconception that perhaps, you know, with machine learning techniques, always you need big data, the bigger the better, but, but it really relates to the variants that are within the data set. Uh, yeah, here you see a, a funny, funny cluster about uh, just the client and, <laughs> and contracts and disputes, um, which forms a big part of constructability. Okay, so now we know that using natural language processing, we could infer topics and semantic links from unstructured texts, and this could be seen as a summary of, of constructability. And when it comes to the action, what you do with it is maybe the, um, the valuable thing. And, it could be very strategic. Some countries take constructability insights and they create constructability guidelines, for instance, or codes. And they have to decide then as a, you know, similar to a manifesto, uh, whether it is generalizable within the industry or should, at, should, should a manifesto or a guideline or a code or some kind of declaration be limited to specific industries. And when it is limited to specific industries, what kind of vocabularies to use there in order to describe and speak to the audience. And when we're talking about speaking to the audience, uh, this is the other example I'd like to show you today, uh, which is very different, but I think it's very different to construction, but it has, I think, very strong relations to uh, denoting codifying Baukultur. And in this case, um, or for those who would have been in Finland, uh, you'll know about Fatser, which is a chocolate company here, uh, but they have a very big restaurant or catering business. And their catering business are very largely targeted at um, business parks and universities and the like, so lunch halls. And these, uh, these lunch halls, they try to have market campaigns that speaks to the public, the, the, the people that would come to these lunch halls. And the whole point of um, this exercise, uh, for them, they were doing a rebranding. Their, their restaurant business was called Amica, if, you, if there's some of you who are familiar with that, and they changed to Food and Company, Food and Co. And uh, this exercise was about what they call consumer insights in order to target and segment the markets to understand what goes on in the head of their uh, potential clients. So the big question was for them, how does the public perceive this concept of brain food? You know, whatever that, that's supposed to mean in a similar way that we might try to qualify. Well, how does the public or how does the community perceive uh, Bau Kultur? You know? uh, and brain food is of course a, a, a multidimensional topic. If you think about nutrition, uh, which is the food side and the cognition, which is the brain side, how does that affect one another? And if you think about food, you know, it's quite cultural. Uh, just as cognition would be. Some might relate more to work, you know, performance levels, stress levels. Some are more into diet, some are more into sports. Others might be, you know, into mental health type questions. And 
different people, different age groups, different locations, they may have different concerns. Uh, for us, you know, in being millennials, uh, maybe we're concerned about certain things versus, um, you know, what baby boomers might be interested in, as an example. So that gives Fatser uh, an idea how to segment their audience and therefore how to appeal to them. So the insight gathering techniques that they use are not much different to uh, generally what workshops do, which is uh, a lot of survey type questions, uh, you know, industry surveys, expert surveys, feedback, free, free form feedback, or in this case, uh, interviews and focus groups, which are very heavily used by Fatser. Uh, and to some extent or another, some social media listening. But all that means is that they look at their social media website and look at the comments there and come up with some kind of um, assumption as to as to how the how the brand and how the different products in different situations are perceived. Uh, there are lots of uh, limitations with this, but there are lots of benefits as well. If it's manual process, there's a lot of intelligence and interpretation that could go into it, but the scale of it is unfortunately limited. You cannot interview uh, you know, 10,000 people uh, just as a matter of practice. It's, it's simply impossible. Um, and so the proposal in this case, and the project that was eventually done, was one of big data scraping uh, for Fatser. Big data scraping and text mining, uh, in addition to the semantic processing. So in the constructability case, we spoke about small data. Now we talk about big data. So what is big data? Uh, it's subjective, but in, in our case, uh, the scraping happens on the web. And uh, we scraped around 4 million text passages over uh, around 11 years um, of time frame. And so the 11 years could be segmented in different ways. Of course, uh, the language is one segmentation. Uh, we did it predominantly in Finnish and English. The Finnish, uh, uh, let's say market is their, their biggest target. So in any case, most of the things uh, were deliberately scraped in Finnish and dealt with as such. Um, different segmentations could be the data source. So publications, news, blogs, or articles, they may represent certain parts of their, certain segments you know, of their uh, market base. So uh, there would be some who are reading blogs, maybe some readership of blogs or young people, some are women's blocks, some are men's blocks. So that's a way for them to see what is the logic and the semantics that would be represented by these different segmentations. Uh, discussions and comments on forums, which is just about the, <laughs> well, from a, from a computational perspective, very interesting. There are lots of internet trolls. They can talk about anything, just about. So uh, also, uh, then lastly, tweets, and just a, around 100,000 tweets uh, that was scraped. So I'd like to show you, without going too much into the, out, the outcomes of, of the project, show you some examples of how to visualize and, and what to read into these visualizations. So segmented, um, segmented Twitter, uh, Twitter tweets, let's say, uh, with respect to cognitive uh, would be some of these outputs that, that, uh, that I show now. And they are segmented by, by for instance, time and location to be able to, to um, give an idea of the, the, the market uh, in different times and locations. So uh, related concepts is the first thing, uh, of course, when you pass any kind of open text, you're able to get texts out and clusters. So these are words as an example to this word cognitive or this concept cognitive. And you see that there are different types of, uh, let's say life uh, or, or some, some so older, midlife, or men and women, gender, you know, some things related to emotion. We also see some that are a bit more scientific, uh, albuminuria, cortisol, GFR, that might be related to food, and then some that are related to this performance, ability, you know, enhancement. So these are, of course, about cognition. And then um, some things related to some lifestyle. Uh, scenario, no? workplace, business, academic. Uh, uh, from there, uh, we can do associations. So this is an example of taking cognitive as a query term. And this is simply, as you can tell, just another visualization of those percentage points that one can do. If Fatser, and they did have a couple of dozen of dimensions that they have chosen with which to compare this cognitive concept with to see how do how do the audience um, associate cognition. So university, school, interestingly enough, 
school is highly associated, but not study, you know, and not education. So this means for them, from an actionable point of view, um, that when they do communications, they ought not to use words that are not used so much by the by the public, but they should focus on words that speaks to the public, that resonates with the public uh, or resonates with their client. So this is one example. Another example is something like this. Uh, in a previous constructability case, we saw clustering, which is hierarchical. In this case, um, we take, let's say, 10,000 tweets and divide it into X number of clusters. So these clusters go on and the clusters would be different uh, sizes and we just rank them from the top to the bottom. So these clusters mean that um, from the 10,000 tweets, we divide them and within this particular cluster, there are a certain number of text passages and this cluster, a certain number of text passages that relates to this topic. The technique that's used in this case is that we first cluster it semantically and then we label the cluster so that there would be text within this cluster that does not explicitly mention the word communication, but that may be semantically related. So those are all grouped together. Um, so regarding cognitive foods, uh, we see some mentions about sleep, uh, orthorexia, which is a, a eating disorder, uh, eating obviously, uh, and so it goes. So this is another way to visualize clusters that gives it one more dimension to look at the cluster sizes. Uh, sentiment analysis could also be done. Sentiment analysis means uh, whether the person or the expression has a positive, a neutral or a negative tone. And this is not exact science and there is a, quite many ways to do this type of thing. But this gives an idea, you know, that we can rank sentiments between uh, zero and 100%, uh, whereas 100% is positive and zero is negative or any other um, range. But basically you get the just here. Uh, one guy says, stop eating bad food, eat organic only. Bad food changes your brain chemistry. You know, that could be labeled as, as negative uh, using the machine learning technique. And in this one, positive eggs are such an amazing food for brain health, full of choline vitamins. So using sentiment analysis, we could combine it with clustering to get some type of um, visualization that looks like this. So these are clusters. So what we do is then we take every cluster like this, we try and classify the text uh, passages that are in there with the sentiment, and then we can simply normalize it and visualize it. So in this way, and there are, okay, so there's 19,000 text passages, so there are dozens of these clusters uh, with cluster labels, and you can very quickly browse and see, hey, within the concept or topic of cognitive performance, education is very positively mentioned. However, development is generally very neutral. And there might be other topics like aging or midlife, which is generally uh, negatively uh, mentioned. How the uh, FATSA responds to this insight is, of course, up to them. Uh, how they have responded is that they like to use words that are emotional in their copywriting. You know, so, so it's not a question of not using negative terms, but they want to know what are the negative things that their clients or their, their customers would care about that they should address. And this is how they are able to choose the more emotive words that would resonate more with their, with their uh, customers. Uh, then there is uh, possibilities of adding new dimensions, you know, so uh, a question could be something like foods that are associated with sleep. Uh, so this could be anything, you know, this could be um, X associated with Y and we go and find, classify uh, foods, extract them from texts and see when have they been mentioned uh, with relation to sleep? And we see 1,700 of these and they were able to cluster them to be able to, to illustrate, hey, the public talks about coffee, sugar, vegetables, um, maybe to a lesser extent carbohydrates uh, relative to sleep. Uh, so these are just some examples, um, a, a lot of different ways of visualizing and interpreting and it all depends on the action. What is the actionable insight? What is the action that is needed? And that determines what insights or what configuration of data is actually required. But in any case, instruments, they remain the same. There is some level of topical clustering, you know, comparing association, sentiment analysis, identify different links uh, using different dimensions and so on. And in the case of FATSER, you know, they, they consider it 
targeted marketing, uh, but it does not necessarily need to be so. So it's very important that we understand that the action depends on the use cases. Um, this one use case, for instance, that we did for um, uh, TECES or Business Finland, they are a governmental organization that funds research and, and innovation. Uh, they use it, for instance, to, to, um, to look for companies uh, with certain track record. Um, they look for topics and innovation uh, partnerships so that their advisors would use the tool to find companies so that they may partner or form a consortium together, you know, to, to apply for a certain call. Um, and there are many different metrics that might help them make that decision. So this again is a very different use case, but the technology and the uh, techniques are often uh, quite the same. Um, there are also other use cases that are more uh, based on this type of mapping or exploratory interfaces. Uh, nine out of 10 times, I would say, exploratory interfaces have to be very carefully designed because they, they might look nice, and they, but they might not have any value. So it's very important then that in any kind of mapping is done that would fit uh, and to fit to the use cases and that the use cases are very well uh, articulated. Uh, often search interfaces are very common and analytics interfaces according to a query is very common, just like this, this ones with FATSER. Uh, so uh, I'd like to leave you kind of with, with one message uh, out of all of this. And, and that's like in, in machine learning, you can do a thousand and one different operations, but very few of them are, are valuable. So, you know, you, you might need to be, this is of course a strategic question, but uh, as data scientists or as researchers, we tend to like to get to the, get to the data or the, the processes and do something cool with that. But then, uh, it's important to ask the question why and so what and how very often. Uh, in our case, how we work, we spend a lot of time uh, describing the domain use cases uh, with the clients and with, with the uh, domain experts in order to uh, find these parameters. And only when we have them, we might think about what kind of machine learning features uh, would be required to address those. So um, just kind of an afterthought, uh, to end off my talk, I think I'd like to kind of pretend that, you know, Baukultur would be a concept for, uh, for an exercise. And how do we go about looking at the, the actionable insights of Baukultur? Well, number one is to define those challenges and goals for the action. What is it that needs to be achieved with the manifesto? Um, or whether there is anything measurable within that. Uh, and the other thing is then, in addition, uh, well, after manifesto, uh, after defining then the, the challenges and the actions and maybe measurable outcomes, what does then the glossary need to be to be able to enable those actions? Uh, this allows a uh, much tighter focus so that not a lot of energy is wasted on doing things which might be more reflective, interesting, even insightful, but that doesn't serve a purpose. And then step three is something that I have noticed already, uh, you know, in ISP1 that you have done uh, quite extensive work in and during your workshops and so on about segmenting these perspectives, segmenting by timeframes. You know, I, I've noticed that you've used this past, present, future uh, kind of mindset as dimensions, different countries or industry um, could be a possibility or different levels of abstraction, which I've understood you've also used, you know, to look at are there texts or topics that are generically understood are there those that are understood only by PhDs and thesis and so on? And based on that segmentation, you can then start to choose the type of data sets. So for instance, um, courses and training and, and guidelines, you know, if they are from polytech versus universities, do they differ? Do they talk about similar things with different vocabularies? Um, whether they are industry guidelines or not might be interesting as well to, you know, if you think, that the industry guidelines represent the industry uh, sentiments and the, the industry concepts, how Baukultur is, Baukultur is, is, uh, is defined. Uh, and of course, on the government level, reports uh, on, on the academia uh, level, research and thesis and the like. And even if they would be talking about similar things, they may well be using quite different vocabularies in the same way that in the media, and so social media just as well, uh, in addition to blogs and other articles, they may be talking about different things with quite different dimensions. And so when you think of the manifesto, you know, what would be the, 
what would be the kind of uh, dimensions that are important? You know, is it more economic? Uh, do one have to focus a bit more when you think about foresight uh, in terms of the manifesto? Does it have to be more about uh, technology? You know, is it more about real estate markets? Is it more about money? So there's a lot of interactions that goes around where um, step one will have to kind of interpret before the segmentation could happen for you to choose the type of data sets to be organized or then to be to be um, analyzed. And lastly, uh, the, the positioning of the technology is also uh, quite a big deal in that, are we talking about you know, existing approaches, augmenting them and improving those existing approach, uh, approaches or having something that's parallel to the process to test and compare a new approach? Now, in the case of Fatser, it was it was rather parallel. So the outputs of the uh, big data analytics is then compared with that of what they did with, the, uh, with traditional techniques. And that might help them come up with new questions, if not, uh, so, so if, if not answers. You know, so machine learning could be also very useful in determining what new questions people <laughs> might need to ask, as opposed to what the answers may be. So uh, that's the end of my talk. and. Um, you're very welcome to stay in touch. I won't say much about our company because I think Günther gave a very, very comprehensive uh, introduction there. Uh, so I think ultimately there is a lot that one can do and uh, natural language processing covers a very broad range of techniques and, and ideas and even philosophies. But what's important is to understand then still the use case. And I think this, this might be a message that's not promoted enough by uh, technologists or data scientists, because they tend to focus on, on the data. And so uh, I think philosophically uh, within our company, we see the, the role that humans play within this process a, a, a lot more. So uh, from my side, thanks very much for your attention. And I look forward to hearing your questions. I have questions of my own, you know, if, if, you, <laughs> if you're awkward to ask questions. Thanks, so let's take it from there. Good, so back to you. Thank you, Vincent. Um, this was amazing uh, overview and, and really uh, uh, good examples to, to, to show how, how, how this approach can be used and, and how we could kind of like push our insights uh, to use your words uh, uh, to kind of like uh, create some, some output and feedback and, and for what reason and for what kind of like address. Um, your, your clo almost closing sentence, I, I would like to catch up with that, um, uh, where you said you try to, um, to integrate uh, the human perspective uh, much more than others do into your research and into your analysis. Um, there is, um, it reminded me, maybe it sounds very silly example, but uh, anyway, um, there is the movie of the Pirates of the Caribbean and there was this sentence uh, of, um, I don't know who was asking who, but the, the center or the question was, what are you doing? And the answer was, no, what are you doing? And the third was, no, what are you doing? So <laughs> how are you dealing with these kind of things? Because it's three times the same sentence in that, in that case, uh, it's three times the same question, but the, the kind of like the focus is totally different. So how to compare that and, and how to deal with this kind of dimension uh, compared to what you were doing with your analysis. Yeah, I, I think that's a very silly, interesting silly example. <laughs> yeah, I think that there are very a lot of nuances in natural language and there are nuances even more in the spoken versus text. So if you're talking about, uh, if, if I understood correctly, you know, if you mention the sentence, what are you doing? Or what are you doing? So the, the emphasis placed on different um, different words may give a different nuance or implication. And there's a lot of things that the machine can't do. You know, that's the, that's the, the, the fact of the, the matter. And um, if there are something that could be codified where there would be a pattern to be identified, um, then it could be detected. But otherwise it's extremely difficult. And therein lies the, the, the crux of the story. And I think you, you describe it very well. Um, so dealing with machine learning, it's very similar to dealing with any engineering problem, how to quantify something which is intuitive you know, to the human. Um, because at the end of the day, it, it's very likely and, and very possible that uh, I'd like to maybe talk about this one, the, the, the few valuable one where the, 
you, you could have perfect answers, many perfect answers to the wrong questions. And if the question, you know, is about the tone or it, how, how you have described it, um, it might not be captured in the model at all. Yeah. So we, we don't deal, we don't actually deal with uh, a tonation on, on, on that level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, this brings me directly to, to another question that we already discussed um, uh, earlier, uh, like the two of us together with Pedro in this case. Uh, it's kind of like the question of um, if you have a, a, a whole amount or magnitude of, of data and you, you try kind of like, you know, somehow in a very, let's say, not very precise, but more rather vague uh, way what to ask. Um, it's kind of like how to get around this um, conflict of biased uh, output. Um, so I know that we discussed that already, but it's maybe also interesting for the audience today. So this kind of like, what kind of question and, and um, is allowed or not allowed? Or how do, you, how do you argue, even if you know that the output might be biased and so on? Yeah. These are very deep uh, philosophical questions that definitely so if you think about bias, uh, you know, in philosophy, there is a concept of bounded rationality so that there is no rationality that is objective. You know, that, that's one way to look at it. And uh, within machine learning models, uh, all of it is, is biased, you know, but when, we, I think there is also, yeah, we have to draw the difference between what bias means in, in different cases as well. But when, when you're talking about um, when there are question and answer, like in a survey, um, in, intuitively, you know, you might affect the, how the user or how the, the respondent thinks uh, by giving a kind of, by wording the question differently. And you might have a series of questions that leads the, the respondent down a path. In other words, you might affect the, the, the respondent in, in different ways. Um, I think these are more, I, I would consider if I have to speak in terms of uh, business applications, uh, those types of philosophical questions seldom, seldomly arise because they are so specific to, I think, uh, abstract, high ab abstraction level, which is often uh, the type of problems we get in research, uh, but not so much in business. You know, in, 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 in practice, uh, questions typically answered are things like, can the data be accessible even to start off with, you know, and, and the size of the data and the, the kind of performances and limitations um, you know what could be what could be the the correlation that can be inferred, and does it make sense? You know what about false positives and false negatives, and these these types of questions. So, yeah, I, I think uh, from the research perspective, I think those questions that you asked are definitely very interesting. Uh, in in reality, however, when we when we deal with these projects in in practice, we seldom actually get the luxury to to talk about those. Yeah. Are there other questions from, from the colleagues or students, participants? Yeah. Uh, is it okay to ask a question? Yes, please, please Anna. <laughs> now I have a real chance. Uh, Hello, I, would, <laughs> I would like to thank you very much. It was really so interesting uh, input to, to our work uh, during the training event. Um, my question is about the context uh, of the words because uh, we know that the same word in different con con context has different meaning. Uh, how you determine the context and uh, you mentioned a little bit about uh, giving this cluster possibilities and stuff but still context mm. is quite tricky. That's right. So there are, there are lots of I nuances. Yeah. Just Go ahead. add to Anna's question because to get exactly it's about the clustering and uh, how exactly I missed this part. It's like, is it that you know more or less in which field you're going, or it's also absolutely automated um, by by the uh, frequency of the words that appear that clusters are defined, just together with the context question? Yeah, excellent question. So let's get into that. Uh, basically, clusters would be determined by the correlation between. Uh, words and and if if a word is uh, let's say we give a threshold of sixty percent, this timber would be clustered to the same as roof, as opposed to this this word waterproof. Uh, 
So there is a sense of um, thresholding over there and choosing the threshold is one aspect. Now let's go a step back and say, how is this number determined? Is it based on um, uh, term frequencies? And, and the answer is yes, partially. So term frequencies are just about the most raw, um, raw way of doing natural language processing. So how many times does a word occur in a document? The more times likely, the more, um, let's say, the more relevant uh, that particular document would be, and therefore it may be clustered. But that's kind of the keyword-based paradigm. So in the natural language processing, we have this problem that there's a lot of words that are not meaning uh, not contributing to the semantics. So there's a lot of what we call stop words, which are like prepositions and articles and that type of thing, which could well be removed. Then there are those words that are very prevalent in the corpus. So imagine if you take uh, a project, project plan corpus. You know, if you have lots of project plans, let's say European, uh, European funded project corpus. So we can bet that in almost every corpus, there's going to be the word project or in every corp or in every single document, almost there would be words like innovation or work, work package. So there is also a hypothesis that we rely on uh, is that the more prevalent the word is across the corpus, the less it contributes as a feature to a particular document. And that way we are able to then demote those. So uh, term frequency is one. Uh, then that's what we call the document frequency, how prevalent it may be. Effectively, it is based on the document frequency. But then how this is also uh, related is um, what, what uh, Anna was talking about, the context of the word. So does the word co-occur with other words? Um, so what are the chances that the word roof <laughs> might co-occur with something quite random that are not related to roof? So I think in any corpus, you can start to assume that the co-occurrence of text is a good justification for how semantically related they are. But of course, it's not discrete because oftentimes things might occur um, very few times together and they might actually be very important. So it's, so not, it's, not, uh, it's not completely discrete and therefore we need a kind of a noise reduction step. So how it goes is that we vectorize the text by um, effectively putting it to a matrix of document to terms. So if you think this is going in a bit of detail, but if you have all the terms on one side, all the documents on the other, and the term frequency uh, modified by its document frequency within the matrix. So th then there's a lot of noise related to how terms uh, are related to documents. But then you start to see that each term and every document could be represented by a vector. And that vector uh, is what we can consider as a semantic vector. So that um, terms that are, let's say that there is a term that co-occur in 90% of the documents with another term. It's very likely that there, uh, even after noise reduction, that there, the feature of that kind of correlation would be very high. And therefore, when you vectorize it and you do a correlation, in other words, a cosine similarity between those two vectors, they would be very similar. So there's kind of a lot of levels in between. And um, after that only comes the clustering. So when you see these kind of clustering results, uh, they are actually very abstract. And that's part of the limitation of this type of technique that when it is a human expectation that the, the uh, results would be explainable, then it creates a lot of hindrances to the use case. Um, so, I think, I, I don't know if I answered your question or created kind of more confusion, but effectively this, this is how th there are a couple of, um, if I had to count on my hand, you know, term frequency, document frequency, uh, co-occurrence of noise, and then a couple of other things that, you know, all together combined in different distributions or different ratios would kind of give the results. And how they are combined uh, could also be optimized and therein lies some, maybe from a researcher's perspective, interesting topics about do you optimize it you know, locally or is there actually a global optimal that you're not seeing? Uh, so that's the problem. So actually every model is not uh, right or wrong. You know, every model is biased and, and every model may be problematic. And it really is up to the use case to tell, hey, how accurate is a model? In many cases, for instance, this type of a search paradigm 
if you think about this, if you search with the word basement, you'll get every every other document in the in the corpus with a percentage score. So it's very difficult to have a cutoff point. And if it is the use case that the user requires there to be a cutoff point, which has a uh, discrete criteria where the cutoff point is, then it's of course totally unusable. 